Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Tuesday, January 8th, 2019 Board of Education meeting. The board has been in closed session since 6 p.m. for the reasons listed on the agenda. All seven board members are present and let's stand for the pledge. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have two recognitions tonight. The first one is the Illinois Music Educators Association All-State Selectees. If those of you being honored could come up and stand in the middle. Good evening. I'm Bill Riddle and I'm the uh, division chair of the Performing Arts Department at York High School. It's, it's my pleasure to be here tonight and particularly my pleasure to recognize and honor these 24 outstanding York High School musicians who have been recognized by the state of Illinois as being all state musicians for the 2018-2019 school year. Let's give them a hand right out of the <laughs> box. I will mention that 24 musicians honored at this level is uh, a very uh, impressive number for us, although we often have many uh, musicians honored. 24 is, is actually one of the highest in the state this year, so we're very proud of them. Um, the organization that is responsible for bestowing this honor is named the Illinois Music Educator Association, or ILMEA. I would also at this time like to recognize our music faculty from York High School, Becky Marionetti, Ray Oswald, Mike Pavlik, and Chris Gemko, as well as recognize our fellow music educators from our District 205 middle schools and elementary schools. Of course, we know this has been a team effort all the way through these um, young people's lives, educating them in music. And let's have a hand for our faculty members as well, please. The ILMEA is a professional organization with the mission to promote lifelong music learning and to provide leadership for music education. This whole process begins every year in October when students from all over the state of Illinois individually audition on a set of predetermined music and technical exercises. The state happens to be divided into nine different districts and York High School is actually a member of District 1 which is the largest and certainly one of the most competitive districts in the state. In District 1 alone, there are approximately 3,000 students from 75 different schools that audition for the honor of being selected into all district band, jazz ensemble, orchestra, choir, and in over the last five, six years, we have students that submit original uh, musical compositions um, that are also adjudicated, and, and they are actually only adjudicated on the state level. And, and, and we have several of our um, students that have been recognized as composers that, um, as part of this group. This year, as um, at the district festival, uh, we were actually very well represented as well. We had 43 of our students that participated in, in a band, orchestra, or choir. Um, and that concert was last, no, well, there were several concerts. There was a jazz concert and then another concert that featured the, the band and the orchestra and choir uh, back in November. At every year after the All District Festival, the students receiving the highest scores of the nine districts are selected to participate at the All State Music Festival, and that will be taking place in just a few weeks in Peoria, beginning on the 23rd of January, um, culminating in a concert on the 26th. Students that were selected for All State recognition will spend all three days there, and not only preparing for the concert, but be able to listen to other uh, musical groups that are there, as well as there are composition students who will actually be participating in a curriculum over those few days of um, hearing uh, not only their own compositions, but um, getting uh, a chance to work with experienced composers and music educators. 
Join me in one more time in congratulating these outstanding accomplishments of these 24 students, and then we will recognize them each individually. Again, let's hear it for these students. Before I read the proclamation, I, I just wanted to recount a story of a uh, friend of mine that I ran into over the holidays who happens to be an administrator at uh, another school in another school district. And um, he took particular note of the number of IMEA members, their winners that we have, and uh, was trying to figure out why that is. And uh, he said, well, you know, it's, it's those great facilities that you have that, that we don't have. And I said, well, we're, we're grateful to our taxpayers for that, but I don't think that's the difference. He said, well, it's that professional recording studio you have. And I said, well, I think that, if anything, that's a minor part, but we're grateful to our taxpayers for that. And he said, well, I, I don't get it, then what is it? I said, well, we do have some things that you don't have. And their names are Bill Riddle, Chris Gemko, Rebecca Marionetti, Ray Oswald, and Mike Pavlik. And hopefully we're going to have them, with the exception of Bill, which is a tremendous loss. Um, hopefully we're going to have those names for a long time. Um, so with, let me read the proclamation for these very deserving students. Whereas the Illinois Music Educators Association, the ILMEA, competitions are considered the most prestigious statewide student recognition program in music education, and whereas high school musicians undergo stringent auditions competing against students from one of nine individual IM, ILMEA districts, followed by the qualifying students earning a place at that district's honor ensemble, from which the all state musicians are chosen. And whereas this program recognizes some of the best musicians in the state of Illinois, and rewards excellence on the part of individual students while encouraging further music study and artistry. And whereas your community high school students, Michael Binderman on the bass, Austin Brown for composition, Anna Collins for composition, Emily Dow, cello, Matt Hauser, bass, Alyssa Ersby, clarinet, Ryland Johnson, viola, Sam Jensen, uh, clarinet, Catherine King, soprano, Charlie Kungel, if I got that, sorry Charlie, <laughs> on the bass, Cece Lampa, alto, Lauren McKinney, double bass, Rose, help me, Menachini. help me Bill, Menachini, sorry Rose, tenor sax, Sienna Olson, French horn, Ben Pavlik, jazz composition, Jake Reeling, tenor, Eddie Ryan, trombone and jazz, uh, Camille Staley, alto, Cece Stump, trumpet, Maya Toffler, composition, Emily Walker, soprano, Maggie Wazins Wazinski, I got, sorry Maggie, <laughs> soprano, Julian Robel, double bass, and Liz Yu, violin, will be awarded all state recognition in their particular music specialty and will perform the All-State Band, Chorus, and Orchestra Festival on January 26, 2019 at the Illinois Music Educators All-State Convention and Festival in Peoria, Illinois. And whereas this accomplishment brings pride and prestige to your community high school, District 205, and our community, now be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205 express congratulations to all of these students, their parents, and faculty members of the York Performing Arts Division, Chairman Bill Riddle, Chris Gemko, Rebecca Marionetti, Ray Oswald, Mike Pavlik, uh, Rebecca, oh, I'm sorry, Anna. Shaposnikov. Shaposnikov, sorry Anna. 
and Michelle Jensen, the entire District 205 music faculty, for this outstanding accomplishment. Congratulations. Now all of you have to now earn this. Here. I'm going to hand you your copy of the proclamation, shake your hand, and we're going to ask you all to turn around and shake the entire board and administration's hands. Congratulations. Okay, thank you again for all the hard work. Uh, Shining Star recipients, if any of them are in the audience, if they could come up. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> thank you for coming up. I love this part of the meeting where we give recognition. We give recognition to our excellent students and families. And as Dave, as Jim mentioned, there's a reason that they're excellent. And it's partly because of our staff. This is a part, the Shining Stars, where we get to recognize the staff. And the really cool thing about this Shining Star is that this recognition doesn't come from the board or the administrators. It comes from their peers who see them every day, know exactly what they do or don't do, <laughs> and all the time that they put in. I've got two shining star recognitions. First shining star is for Martha McGrill. She's the lead secretary at Edison. And she was nominated by the entire Edison staff. Here's what they have to say. Martha is always thinking of everyone else. She does tasks above and beyond her job that help the teachers. She is always thinking of ways to make everything in the building run smoothly. She takes the time to build relationships with parents and staff, which make her the perfect face of Edison School. She makes everyone feel understood and is always working to support everyone in the school and to make everyone who comes into Edison feel important. They say there are no stupid questions, but Martha gets asked a lot of questions. <laughs> questions from kids, questions from teachers, those questions when you have no idea who to ask, it appears that the Edison staff says, just ask Martha. <laughs> they say the list is endless. No matter what she's doing, 
Martha always finds the time to answer the questions or find an answer, and she does it so kindly. She has such a wonderful personality and a great sense of humor and can make you feel that any question is okay to ask. When you have no one else to turn to, you can always count on Martha. Martha embodies the spirit of the school. This is what they said, Martha. <laughs> she puts the children first and takes care of every little one that comes through her doors. Martha is definitely a shining star. That is amazing. That's a testament from your peers. Congratulations. Martha, do you want to stand for the next shining star? You've been getting all of this attention. Okay. Well, we're going to have Martha go through and shake everyone's hand so we can all say thank you for all that you do um, and recognize um, the value that you have at Edison. But then we have one more shining star recognition um, that even though the person isn't here, I want to make sure I read it so they are recognized. But first, thank you very much, Martha. Thank you. You are thank you. amazing. We have so many wonderful people, so many wonderful staff members in our community, and we are definitely blessed um, because of that. These are just two that have been recognized, but I want to make sure I call attention to each of these. The other person, Jan Dolan, um, from a building um, district uh, from Lincoln School, was not able to be in attendance, but I want to be sure I read hers. Jan has been the tech rep at Lincoln for roughly two years. She has gone out of her way to help the students and teachers with all of their technical difficulties. She is quick, understanding, patient, knowledgeable, and knows how to work with teachers and students. Whenever there's a problem with a projector, Elmo, Chromebook, or laptop, she is there that day to help. She takes the time to listen to the problem or concern. After she hears the problem, she sits down and helps to solve it. She also follows up after the problem has been solved. Jan encourages teachers to go out of their comfort zone to continue to try new things and is always there to help when they fall. She teaches them how to use new and existing technology with lessons and projects. She is patient and has the ability to explain the technology that makes sense and is best for students at all levels. Lincoln School is lucky to have her, and Jan Dolan is truly a shining star. Jan is not here, but please let's give her a <laughs> I am going to give this to Dave. Okay. He's accepting in her honor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next portion of our meeting, which is public comments. The board will receive public comments for up to three minutes concerning items on this agenda as well as communication, petitions, reports from citizens or representatives of other public agencies. I have no one signed up, so if there are no public comments, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Okay, uh, next is reports and presentations. 
Uh, we're going to switch the order and do middle school reorganization presentation year two update from learning and teaching first. Good evening, everyone. It's actually not the whole learning and teaching team. It's Dr. Cohen and I. So uh, we're happy to be here tonight to talk about um, the year two of the transformation of our middle school experience for our students. So again, as we do at the beginning of every one of our presentations, we want to take us back to our district vision of graduating all of our students competent in the six C's. Uh, we do that through um, supporting our schools and supporting our classrooms and students uh, and providing strategies and instruction that are grounded in rigor and relevance. Our learning and teaching priorities for this year talk about creating a shared understanding and measurement of our district vision, developing curriculum resources and assessments um, that reflect rigor and relevance, and supporting instructional strategies aligned to rigor and relevance in the six C's. And really the, the transformational work we've done with our middle schools really speaks to all three of these learning and teaching priorities. So no handy dandy blue arrow tonight. So our objective tonight is to provide you with updates on year two of our middle school changes and preview the anticipated changes for next year as we move into 2019 and 20. So just a quick overview and then we're going to go point by point uh, through each of these changes. We brought sixth grade band, orchestra and chorus into the school day. Uh, it is now one, an option to be one of two elective periods. We implemented Project Lead the Way at the middle school. World language is now an option versus a requirement for our students as they enter middle school. And while this was not um, part of the changes that came out of the middle school task force, it was a change related to curriculum development this year, and I just thought it would be a good idea to review those changes. So it's a reduction of tracking in sixth grade math. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Cohen. Okay, so the, uh, we decided to throw some of the numbers from the sixth grade band and orchestra, not only from this year on the board, but also the enrollment that we have to this point for next year, and compare it to historical averages over the five years previous to this one, so you have an idea uh, about what, in, what, if any, impact has been had on the uh, music programs by bringing band, orchestra, and choir into the school day. Uh, we separate band and orchestra out to talk about because band and orchestra start as, as programs starting in fourth grade. Um, where they are learning their instruments, um, where the choir is more of a club, this is more of a um, more of a structured course, and it's in power school, and so we can grab numbers for that historically uh, very easily, where we don't have access to those numbers going back uh, for choir. Um, but on average, the number of sixth grade students in music and band and orchestra alone averages about 160 students. Uh, this year, with band and orchestra in the day for sixth grade, the number is 168. So that number was basically unaffected um, by, the, by the fact that they uh, had to make a few choices. Next year we're trending towards 189 students in band and orchestra. This is a high over the last seven years that we've looked at the, looked at the data. Uh, with any luck, that means that with this being a high number in 2019-20, that in 2025-26 you'll have an even bigger group here standing in front of you as we'll have more student uh, musicians matriculating through the system. Uh, the retention rates are also listed. This is looking at a fifth grade cohort from one year to the sixth grade the following year. Uh, full disclosure, what was posted on the website, the presentation posted on the website, um, the numbers look different. When I worked in this last week, I had a bit of a food coma. I will use that as an excuse from all of the, uh, from all of the holidays. Uh, but it helps if you use the right divisor. Really, uh, we, lose a, we lose a good number of students from fourth grade to fifth grade. Once they try an instrument, they decide they like it, they don't like it. But from, sixth, from fifth grade to sixth grade, once they come into the middle school, those students generally, the numbers stay the same. They even rise slightly. Like, for example, this year, the number went up. Part of that can be attributed to move-ins, uh, but a good chunk of it are students that, let's say, pick up a, a violin in fourth and fifth grade and then decided to add a second instrument when they reach middle school. So sometimes those students will then be participating. We actually have sections of uh, band, orchestra, or choir orchestra for those students that participate in two classes. Um, and so they split their time. They'll spend two days a week uh, in one class and three days a week in the other, and then they flip. 
Uh, and then for next year, we're retaining about 99% of the students. It's actually 189 students that will be so they're currently signed up for a sixth grade band out of 191 that are in fifth grade band and orchestra currently. Seventh and eighth grade band, uh, the retention rate is also right about, it's about 90% uh, year over year. These are combined both uh, seventh and eighth grade for, the, for four years. Um, and the numbers really bear themselves out to be, again, essentially the same. We're going to have a number, the same number of students in band and orchestra in next year in seventh and eighth grade. Now, this is, will be the first time that seventh and eighth graders will have to make a choice. This year, seventh and eighth grade band and orchestra is still before the school day. Um, but next year with the choice, these numbers are not impacted uh, and the retention rate is essentially the same. That 277 number, that while it is a little higher than average, the retention rate's a little lower than average because we do have more students currently in uh, sixth and seventh grade band than we typically would have. So those numbers are a little bit bigger. Um, really these cohorts have not changed very much. Choir numbers are a little bit more uh, spotty from year to year because coming in sometimes the group will start off the cohort will start off very small and they will rise through seventh and eighth grade other times it will start off large and drop through seventh and eighth grade uh, so those um, but those numbers have remained largely unchanged really for year over year but it's a pretty small sample size project lead the way enrollment uh, this year about 35, 36 percent of the students across the district chose to enroll in Project Lead the Way in our middle schools at all three grade levels. Um, Brian's represent a little bit more um, in terms of a percentage, and, and numbers-wise, they're a little bit larger. But uh, when we look at next year, the percentages are roughly the same. Um, that is, with bringing uh, choice to seventh and eighth grade, the students that um, are in seventh and eighth grade are still choosing to take Project Lead the Way courses. As a, as a part of their elective curriculum. So those, those numbers are, uh, I, I feel very good about those numbers in the program, especially now that after, after having gone through the first year of a curriculum, the sixth grade curriculum is gonna remain the same, the seventh grade curriculum will be new again, uh, but those students are choosing to stay in the system, which we're very excited about. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit now about world language, and I'm sorry, the formatting kind of Got a little bit funky here as it's projected. Um, so the first chart shows you um, the number and percent of our sixth, current sixth graders. That's our first cohort of students where foreign lang uh, world language was an option for them versus a requirement for participation. So you can see that uh, in the far right hand column, about 35% of our sixth graders at Bryan, 39% at Churchville, 24% at Sandburg elected uh, to choose that three-year accelerated language path. And just as a reminder, when they choose that option in sixth grade, they stay in that program for three years and they complete the equivalent of level one and level two in either French or Spanish. Okay. Next year, um, as we offer for the first time the two-year langu language option, so that is our students who move into seventh grade have the option of starting a language and staying with it for two years and completing what is equivalent to level one at the high school level. Um, when I combine, and again, as I uh, shared in an email to you, our, our enrollment numbers, specific numbers, are very early projections because we really are just finishing up some student selection uh, process. But overall, when we look at the percentage, when I look at sixth and seventh graders, so next year, sixth and seventh graders, the percent of students who have decided to um, opt in for a world language experience, you can see we'll be at around 49% at Bryan, 44% at Churchville, and 39% at Sandberg. That tells me a couple of things. One, uh, when I look at it, I say, okay, now that we've given kids the option, over half are choosing to have some other types of experiences, whether it's music, whether it is Project Lead the Way, um, some of the electives that we offer, they are opting for those choices. Sometimes it's because they know that, they already know that they want to take Italian or Chinese at the high school, and so they're opting not to have a world language experience in middle school. So that can be one of the reasons. 
rather than invest the time in middle school taking part in a language that they know they're going to switch in high school they've just opted not to do it um, i think it also speaks to some of the parent education that we've done about what is required with world language as our students are leaving york what levels they need to have and helping parents understand that it's okay to start at level one in high school if that's what you believe is best for your child So when we look at the um, curricular changes with sixth grade math, um, we used to have reach math, we continue to have reach math. We previously had three levels of math in sixth grade. Reach math, um, a course that was called Math 2, which was somewhat accelerated, and then Math 1. Math 1 um, really covers the sixth grade content, which are critical foundational conceptual ideas that our students need to grasp. Um, when Learning and Teaching looked at some historical trend data, we saw that as students advanced to high school, many times kids who advanced through curriculum too quickly, we found that as they got into some of um, the upper grades in high school, they were falling off because they had missed many of those foundational skills. So um, we have everyone who is not in REACH Math is in our sixth grade um, math course. Uh, the instructional model has shifted tremendously, um, particularly for secondary classrooms. They're utilizing a workshop model. We have quite a bit of job embedded professional development going on with our sixth grade math classrooms across each building where um, a consultant we are working with comes in, spends time in the classroom with the teachers. There are peer observations. Um, where teachers are going into each other's classrooms and observing the components of workshop. They get feedback. Um, so it's really a nice uh, professional learning model to support them. Uh, also within that, because they're using the workshop model where um, kids are working in small groups based on levels of readiness, students are able to also work on seventh grade standards. Um, that are supported by the classroom teacher. And when we get to the end to talk about changes for next year, I'll, I'll come back to why that's important. All right, Dr. Cohen is gonna talk about the enrichment portion of acceleration. So we've been working uh, with our, the assistant principals from each school to um, refine the enrichment programs, especially the, the, the selection of courses um, that are available to students. We do have now the addition of uh, the availability to uh, schedule it electronically, which has made life a little bit easier for some of our team leaders and, and for folks at the building level. Um, we have a large percentage of our students getting their first, second, or third choices, and this is and this is any given term. So, on any given term, as the choices change, um, students are still able to get, by and large, their their first, second, or third choices. We do look to make sure students aren't duplicating uh, electives or du duplicating those uh, enrichment courses but they are um, by and large getting what, what it is that they need. Um, sign language has been a huge draw at some of our buildings. The stop-go animation as well, uh, using some of the things they learned with we Video, where they're you know, making some drawings and then changing them very incrementally over time. The popsicle stick structures, they test for strength. Um, so these, these courses have been uh, getting refined over time. Uh, we met with team leaders in December to talk a little bit about the acceleration process. Um, because we had noticed that the amount of new courses coming from our teachers had slowed down a little bit. Um, you know, as, as you might imagine, when we first created the acceleration, there's a huge wave of things being created, and then the school year happens. And so, you know, they get into the business of what it is that they do, and things start to slow down. Uh, so we reminded folks that we are, you know, we are there to support them in the creation of these courses, and that we have the ability to uh, compensate them for their uh, you know, for whatever materials that they need to acquire for these courses. So uh, we did see, I did see a few new courses come in, uh, applications coming right before break, so we'll get those up and running here in the second semester. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the intervention side of acceleration because it's important that we not lose sight that that really is the primary reason for the existence of acceleration, is to support our students who are struggling with grade level content. So um, when we think about tier two, students who need tier two support, that's talking about kids who are maybe just a little bit uh, below grade level up to about two years below grade level. That would be considered tier two. Across the district, about 6% of our students would fall into that range. The support for those students take pl takes place daily during acceleration. 
So the 30 minutes of acceleration time, they are getting support from either a math content teacher or a reading specialist. Um, participants can be added or exited throughout the year. We have entrance and exit criteria, and we continue to monitor and benchmark the students. Um, I will say, however, depending where students fall in the range of support that they need, um, it would not be unusual for a student to need to receive support for an entire year. If you come in one to one and a half years below grade level in reading, that is not a quick overnight change. That's going to take um, some repeated uh, and intensive support. So when we talk about students who need tier three supports, that's typically students who are two or more years below grade level. About 4% of our students fall into that range. Um, intervention for those students um, in reading at all three buildings takes place during an elective period. So in place of the UA wheel, in place of a world language, but in place of an elective. At Churchville, because we have significantly more numbers, um, more number of students who need tier two or tier three math support, we added a math strategies um, class there because of the need. And so um, at Churchville, the tier three students receive that uh, intervention during the elective period. The numbers are, are significantly smaller at our other two middle schools and tier two and tier three students in math are supported during acceleration. So percentage, you may think, hmm, that, that's, that's not a huge percent, but when we talk about students and numbers of students, there's 140 stu 142 students receiving tier two or tier three reading support and 117 students receiving tier two or tier three math support. Now, some of those students are the same because we do have many students who get both reading and math support, but um, that's a lot of kids and that is critical that they get that support and time that they need. When we go back to why we brought this into the school day, I want to take us back to what research tells us is best practice in supporting struggling students. It's critical that the intervention take place during the school day. Why? Because it has to be mandatory. It can't be an optional support. We can't allow students to opt out of moving up to grade level because we know the longer we put off bringing them up to grade level, the, the less likely it is that they'll ever meet standards. Um, the support has to be in addition to core content. So while we have the um, luxury and um, have shifted to a model where many of our reading specialists push into a language arts classroom, that's not enough because that's the core content. They're supporting those students accessing the grade level curriculum. They still need what we call and more uh, of receiving additional time and support in addition to the, their ELA class. Mary, can you yes. please also cover in, in, in relation to acceleration the, the changes we made in um, the uh, length of the units and Oh, sure. And a couple yes. other things like that. that yes. uh, and then the, uh, the second thing, too, um, the schools are also now um, uh, trying to develop and, uh, some systems for Tier 1 students who mm -hmm. um, don't need, uh, you know, maybe they're struggling with a particular concept at a particular point in time, but there's the flexibility uh, to, to move in and out during periods of time. Can, can you yes. explain what they're doing sure. with those two things? So um, the tier one support actually started last year. So tier one support would be considered, I am struggling with um, solving for X in math, okay? I am struggling with, I'm, I'm generally uh, right on grade level, but I am struggling with a particular concept. So our, our grade levels at each of our buildings have developed a system where um, uh, a teacher can float in to support perhaps the enrichment unit that you are teaching so that you can step out, take some kids that need extra support in, in a concept or a skill, pull them out of their enrichment for a day or two or three, provide them some reteaching, some practice, some support, and then the kids go back to their enrichment. Okay? And so they cycle through the different content areas so that kids get that support during that time. Okay? So that was something that um, started, it, about this time last year um, in all three of our schools. 
Um, this year, uh, last year, our enrichment units lasted th on three weeks. Every three weeks, the kids changed, and we had guidance that was part of the school day. Uh, it was one of the in, uh, it was one of the spokes on the enrichment wheel. Um, but only sixth and seventh graders had access to guidance. This year, we've expanded our enrichment units to four weeks so that guidance um, one day a week, uh, all of the students spend in a home base in their team. The guidance counselors push in and do a monthly lesson. The home base teacher follows up with a reinforcer lesson another week. One other week of that month, they're doing goal setting, goal reviewing, and then finally the last week they can do some team building. They have some flexibility. Team building within their home base unit, team building across the grade level, team building across the team. So um, that, that's been a nice shift and we've moved it into eighth grade as well. So all students in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade receive guidance um, on an ongoing basis throughout the year. Part of the reason for that change, one was that our eighth graders weren't receiving any guidance, but. I shouldn't say that. It's not that they didn't have the option to see the guidance counselor. It wasn't something that all students were provided. Um, secondly, uh, depending on where guidance fell for your particular rotation on the wheel, you might not see the guidance counselors um, for part of the curriculum until the very end of the year. This allows all students to have the same types of lessons um, and same types of skill development ongoing throughout the year. Okay, uh, changes for 2019-20. Okay. So again, we, uh, we expand band workers required during the school day to all grades, grades six through eight. Um, we are expanding the project lead the way options. We have the two uh, courses that were taught at grades six, seven, and eight this year. Grade six will remain the same, but the students that are matriculating the seventh and eighth grade, if they're in project lead the way, will have already seen that curriculum. So we're adding two new semester courses in, uh, which you've seen the app creators and the flight in space. And then with math, now that we have the, the, the ability to go to a pre-algebra class in seventh grade, we have made recommendations for students that we believe are prepared for seventh grade pre-algebra versus the seventh grade math, which would prepare them for pre-algebra in eighth grade. Um, but student, families that feel like their students should be in that accelerated track do have the option of opting in uh, to that as well. We do have, you know, we're, we are trying to couch this in some data and show folks that this is, you know, what we, the recommendation we make is appropriate, but if people feel like they know that their child can handle the work, we want to give them that option. Are there any questions? Karen? I'll start with your last slide. So uh, thank you for the update for middle uh -huh. school. And the, the point of the um, sequencing is uh, you covered sixth grade where it's reach or math one, mm -hmm. and then seventh grade is pre-algebra or something else, and then the pre-algebra would then, that's when the geometry comes in in eighth grade or something else? Okay, so help. Okay, so in sixth grade, students are either in math one or reach, mm -hmm. which is pre-algebra for them, okay? So as students move into seventh grade, they would either be in the seventh grade curriculum, pre-algebra, or our REACH students would be in algebra. Okay. As eighth graders, our REACH students are in geometry. Students who took pre-algebra as seventh graders would take algebra as eighth graders. Students who are in the seventh grade curriculum as seventh graders are in pre-algebra as eighth graders. And that's this, having uh, students having the option to opt in to pre-algebra is why our teachers are supporting students with seventh grade math standards throughout this year in sixth grade. So that they can enrich students, students who are looking for a challenge, students um, whose parents have identified that they believe their child can handle that, that challenge and want that for their student. Um, that is available and that's why the workshop model is such an important approach for instruction. Once again, clarifying the workshop model is um, where you can group students that mm -hmm. 
You can group students the, by, by level of readiness. Mm -hmm. You can, depending on what you are working on, mm -hmm. they could be completely flexible groups where they are heterogeneous and mixed abilities. It just really gives the teacher a lot of flexibility. I can have a group of students who are working on problem solving in collaborative groups while I've pulled five students to provide some enrichment to with the seventh grade math standards, or maybe I've pulled a different group who needs some extra um, reinforcement or reteaching with a concept. And then um, the options are, you know, based on performance teacher recommendation or student and parent um, saying that the student, you know, they want to yes. do more. So right. let's just let's as we've done at the high school. Do that. Just as we've done at the high school, where we've allowed students to opt into honors English or an honors track. Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful. It's a great example of us truly. Um, having the actions behind saying we believe in the students. I, yeah. There's so much to be said about that because mm -hmm. they will rise to the occasion. Yeah. I wanted to add one thing to that. Um, we think that one of the reasons why the, the tutoring uh, at the high school has been so uh, prevalent is because a lot of the students that were skipping sixth grade math missed a lot of really important foundational skills. Our middle school principals have been troubled by that model, um, well, to my knowledge, ever since I've been here. But uh, also, along with this adjustment, something that's really important is that in the past, if the student took algebra in seventh, eighth, or ninth grade, it was a different course, depending on what year they took it which resulted in them having different math experiences. And so then the entire rest of the curriculum was tailored on up the line where kids would get stuck in these tracks. And so what, what we've been able to do now is, is we've um, configured it so that no matter when they take algebra, it's the same course so that they're ready for geometry so that now next year, whenever they take geometry, it'll be the same course. And, and that way, we used to have a system where they would take Geometry 9 or Geometry 10. And so then the, the kids would get to high school and the geometry would be two different courses. So once again, they weren't getting the same experience. All of these things have staffing implications as well. But, but it's, it's uh, now we're able to verify and ensure that when students take a certain course, they're being exposed to what we think they need to learn in geometry or whatever the, the case may be. Yeah, we would have a, for example, the existence of the Frost geometry class, which is no more. It was for students that were gonna take geometry but had not yet mastered algebra because they had pushed through sixth grade math so quickly. Sixth grade is such a critical year for learning math because that's where the you know ratios, fractions, proportions, those things are emphasized. Those are the foundations of algebra. It comes down to the heart of algebra. And so without those skills, we we're, were rushing through sixth grade and half of seventh grade math in 45 minutes. Well, now we're spending 75 minutes on sixth grade math to give that foundation or give that, that, that math experience a strong foundation for the rest of their middle school and high school career because that's really what's going to make them a successful math student going forward. Can I ask one question related? Uh, related to the same subject. Do you happen to know off the top of your heads, um, by eighth grade, what percentage of kids are in geometry versus algebra versus pre-algebra? I do not know that off the top okay. of my head, but we right. can get that for you. All right, that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So based on what you said, Mark, I mean, I assume that, I'll look at Marianne, we're gonna watch those trends or we're gonna track the students and see, Yes. has it given us the results that mm -hmm. we think yeah. uh, intended? Yeah, I could tell you that while I don't know exactly the role between geometry, algebra, and pre-algebra, I know that about 60% of our students leave the middle school having already had an algebra completed. So it would be students that were in algebra or geometry. But I, can't, I don't know the breakdown how many students are actually in geometry. I'll stand alone off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, what about pre-algebra? Is that a similar type of class where it's no matter what year you take it sixth seventh or eighth it's the same for pre-algebra the standards are the same yes okay. the standards are the same um, when students are taking the um, the when the seventh grade math course comes online next year mm -hmm. it is going to be seventh grade it, it's going to be sort of a blend so you're not going to the the, the pre-algebra course that students will take in seventh grade is going to be 
pre-algebra plus a little bit of the seventh grade math that would have been there before to get that, you know what I mean, because it's a new course. So is it an identical course? No, because it's an accelerated course, so it's going to have to cram in a little bit more than a year's content into that year's time. But that's the reason, again, why that 75 minutes is so important. 75 minutes also is important because of the concerns that people were having when kids were taking geometry in eighth grade. And so that, that made it a lot easier for us to make geometry, geometry all the way across the board. So I just wanted to ask about the workshop model. Are you, what kind of professional development are you providing to support the teachers in that? Because it's a much different, you've got two things going on, 75 minute class mm -hmm. periods and workshop model where you're expecting enrichment or seventh grade. You know, so how, what does that look like? So that's where we've brought in um, a consultant that has done some professional learning um, working with the group of math teachers during late arrivals. Um, but the best part of the professional learning is um, the consultant going into the classrooms um, and providing support and feedback as teachers are trying out this model. So they're getting in the moment feedback. Um, they're doing uh, peer observations where they're going into each other's classrooms when the consultant is here. So they're hearing, they're hearing that feedback from the consultant and seeing kind of what it looks like from their peers as well. And then, of course, our instructional coaches are available every day for them in the building. Just because in, it would be important to me to ensure that all the students have an opportunity to try those uh, the higher level grade standards. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes. yes. So, yeah, yeah. so all sixth grade teachers are getting that professional learning. It's not just those who signed up for something, it's, it's provided to all of them. Another thing that we're beginning to do that we haven't done much of in the past is we're starting to figure out some ways to uh, revise our summer school experience so that we do more enrichment types of things. And so we can create some bridge courses for these kids now um, where they may be on the cusp, their math development was coming around a little bit later and, and they could be ready to be pushed up. Um, with a little bit of extra support and we can bridge that, you know, between uh, their, their grade levels uh, in summer. So we're looking at some models to figure out how to refine ways to do some of that. Is that coming, Dave? Uh, at the high school, those courses are already being offered. Those were part of the offerings that uh, are being offered this summer, those bridge courses. They're being offered in all four of our core areas for students that are considering the jump to honors that aren't quite, you know, they've been successful, maybe they want to learn to challenge themselves. Um, our enrichment courses in the middle schools, we are going to be offering Project Lead the Way this summer. That's going to be coming out soon. Um, and then the uh, Title I Summer School that always runs has a component to it that where they're doing math, they're doing, they're, they're using um, algebra skills as part of it. Last year, for example, they had to start, they were doing a food truck business. And so there were square footage calculations and uh, there were financial calculations. So again, things, ratios, proportions, if I sold this many versus this many, you know, what would, my, what would happen to my, uh, my profit, et cetera? Where's my break-even point? Uh, where's my maximum? Where would I maximize my profits at one point? Do I start getting diminishing returns? Those were things that the students worked on. Um, in the context of a food truck, which was fun because the food truck pulls up one day and they have a, have a chance to talk to the owner and eat, but, but also they, you know, they had the chance to do math without realizing they were doing math. About 100 students in geometry in eighth grade. Not in eighth grade, any grade. Any middle school grade. Which it's only be, offered to eighth grade. But it's only offered to eighth grade, so. No. No. <laughs> Margaret. A question about guidance. Sure. Um, so you mentioned. Well, I think it's fabulous that um, guidance is now offered in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade because I, those are very critical years and it's, it's nice to um, have that option. Um, what I'm wondering uh, is the configuration in guidance and in in the topics. Um, since it's offered also in eighth grade, but there's a change in how it's offered, are the, is there a change in the topics that are being covered or and are there more topics being covered and or is there more depth in the topics of being covered so uh, last year um, 
uh, guidance came under student services and, and Dr. Kostek really led um, the guidance counselors through de the development of that work. They had identified sort of the priorities for um, eighth grade decision making, um, sort of that preparation for the next step uh, in their educational journey. Um, so it was really driven quite a bit by the guidance counselors and what they felt were the critical pieces based on what they see. Kathy, you want to add anything to that? Yes, it was very, um, it was a very positive response from the, the counselors about being able to do things more timely and align in particular with the eighth grade with the activities that they need to do, that the students need to do in preparation for entering York. And actually just today I met with the two, the middle school department um, guidance chair and the high school department chair and Dr. Moore from York High School and we were talking about we're kind of in the you know coming to the close of those activities and how it's been very successful and we have another meeting in February with all the counselors together um, but the work that Dr. Henderson is referring to um, the counselors took the entire year and looked at all of the different activities that were already occurring in the building and how we could build upon those um, and there were so many advantages to having the opportunity to cycle through those things throughout the course of the year. It's been a very positive change. John? Right, I was, I was going to get off topic too. But I have two on topic questions and then one off okay. topic. But since you ventured into summer school at York, and since I spent 9 o'clock glued to my computer this morning so I could uh, register my kid for summer school, the options for summer school, is it just me or do they seem a little light this year? We have no world studies this year. Um, the world studies uh, that has typically been a big chunk of the summer school enrollment, um, that course is a freshman course is being supplanted by the human geography course. And so that curricular work will wrap up this summer and that course will launch this fall. We did not feel it was appropriate to launch a new course in a summer school format. Um, so that course is going to launch this fall with the additional option of taking the Human Geos and AP course. So um, because of that, you'll, you do, there were less courses offered. The, number, the same number of FCS courses were still there. Um, but for example, FCS, we have two foods labs. So we're, you know, we're, we are space limited in, in some of those offerings that we have. But the, the elimination of that big social science core course that many students would take and then open up room for an elective has been something I'm sure people noticed. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, off topic, but. But next I, year we will be able to offer that human geography course again during okay, summer school in the, incoming in the freshman. summer. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I started comparing ours to a couple other school districts, summer school, and. What I noticed was other districts, now these are high school districts, so there's multiple high schools in the same district, and mm -hmm. we have one, I get that. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a lot more offerings, and their tuition is higher. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, you know, so maybe they can support smaller class sizes in, uh, because of their tuition, and maybe they can economically support smaller class sizes in some of the less popular courses they offer. Sure. Just throwing that out there and something no, that, you're right. And look good. into. In some districts, though, uh, I can speak for my previous district, the high school had a seven period day. So, and one of the courses that was required of freshmen in my previous district was a reading course. Freshmen had no elective, unless they chose to do summer school or pay for an optional early morning class, which started at 7.15 a.m. So, summer school was by far the, by far the most popular option. <laughs> Because, you know, getting up, you know, all 26 days of your summer to, to come and, you know, drag your uh, butt in at, seven, at uh, uh, 7 o'clock for 26 days is a lot easier than doing it over 175. So um, for that reason, to open up that eight slots so a student can be in band or take a language, students would take summer school. York does have the advantage of having an eight-period day. So students can get more in their day than some schools which may have shorter uh, you know, have a short school day. Some schools have an eight period day, but only have 45 minute periods to make that happen. So, uh, you know, it, it, there, are tr there are some trade offs and you are right that larger districts that have multiple high schools will have one summer school program at one site and perhaps offer more electives because of the sheer volume of students that are in the system. Um, all right, let me, let me go back on topic because that's a, 
way longer discussion for another day, and it's not on the agenda. But um, can we go back to the world language slide? Yes. So are those numbers, you know, between the, the first chart and the bottom chart, are those additives? So, you know, um, so I can add those up and say 85% of Brian kids are? No. Um, the top slide is just this year's sixth graders. Okay. And the bottom slide is this year's sixth graders and next year's incoming sixth graders. So kids who have decided either as a sixth grader or a seventh grader to have a world language experience. That's because Jim, the eighth grader, still had to finish out the old sequence. Yes. Got it. Yeah, our eighth Got graders it. are still, our next year's eighth graders are still in that path where language was required for them. Okay, so, so for instance, at Brian, um, only 50% of the kids are in world language by seventh grade. Next year, yes. Got it. And at Sandburg, 39%, if I'm reading that correctly. Churchville, 44%. And Churchville, 44 Okay, that's interesting. And then yes. what? When this whole, when we first started talking about this, it seems like the community's objections were, oh my gosh, I got to between, choose between world language and all the other options available. And then as you peeled back the onion, you realize that, you know, and it, it took a while to, to, to finally, you know, get enough information to realize that starting your kid in sixth grade might not be the best option um, because so many colleges require three or four years of not the equivalent work, but right. it has to be done in high school to meet those colleges' requirements. Yes. So enrolling your kid in sixth grade world language was actually kind of doing them a disservice depending upon where they were going to college. And depending, well, or depending on what their passions are. As, right. as I think about my own three children, I had one who would have who would have opted for that sixth grade choice because language was a passion for her and would have loved that opportunity to really advance through ACP courses, et cetera. Where my other two, I had to drag them through two years in high school. So it looks like from the top chart, it looks like the word is kind of getting out yes. that, that there's that that may not be the best option for all kids. Yes. Um, but then the, the bottom slide um, says that more than 50% of our students are electing to start out first year world language in high school. Yes. Okay. That is what that is telling us. Yeah, okay. I mean, that just seems low to me, but. I, I think it does too, um, but as Dr. Cohn showed in the slides with band and orchestra, are, we're not seeing a dip in our band and orchestra numbers. So as kids are making choices, they're saying, we really want to stick with the music program. And we are okay. And, and so what we'll do instead is start world language in high school. Okay. And that's the trade-off? That, that, that would be a trade-off. Because they have two elective choices, two periods in their day for an elective. Okay. So their choices are, as sixth graders, uh, band orchestra choir, world language, the UA wheel. If they don't take band orchestra chorus and if they don't take a language, then they have the UA wheel and project lead the way. Got it, okay, so it's, it's like take two of four. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you for mm -hmm. that clarification. Sure. Um, if anybody has any more world language questions, feel free to pile in because then I'm going to sure, the yes, intervention. I do. I do, before you. All right. Just. Uh, so the language, so if you're a sixth grader and you decide to take a language all through middle school, what is your high school language experience look like? Let's say just, let's stick with Spanish. So mm -hmm. do you have an option to take Spanish all through high school then to get three or four years or? Yes, you do. You would start out uh, at Spanish, um, okay, I'm, I'm taxing my memory a little bit um, from the presentation we do to our middle school parents. You start at Spanish three or three honors. Um, freshmen, uh, sophomores through seniors can take three honors as an ACP course. Freshmen cannot take an ACP course because to enroll in an ACP course, Indiana University requires a high school GPA. 
And so that's not an option that's available for our students. So they are in three or three honors. Um, by sophomore year, they can move into ACP level work or AP coursework. So there is a combination of AP courses um, and ACP coursework that allows them um, to take language all through their senior year. The same with French. Um, Spanish has two AP options. Uh, French only offers one AP option, and that's not York's um, limitations. That's what's offered uh, by AP. And um, we're also looking at perhaps some partnering opportunities with Elmhurst College for things like medical Spanish. Um, there is, uh, at Elmhurst College, a French for Business so um, as we start, we, we are several years out from having students at that level, but we're already perusing some of the um, local colleges to see what are some partnering opportunities for those kids as they get to that level. And are you, I'm assuming this from based on what you're saying, but there's a lot of education going on for parents. I know it's hard to think about high school when right. you're going into sixth grade with your first child because yes. it feels so far away, but uh, you kind of have your yes you so when we do our fifth grade parent presentations we show them um, just like you would see uh, in the high school course catalog we show them the map and the path of where that takes them from sixth grade all the way to senior year so that parents have have enough information to make that choice for their child Thanks. Mm -hmm. And having been a part of those conversations last year at Bryan Middle School, when you start talking with a bunch of fifth grade parents about college admissions and you see their eyes glaze over, right? They're, they don't necessarily come here looking for that, but that's, you're right, that's the education piece that we have to provide that early so they understand the ramification of the decisions that they're making. Because I think, you know, the whole, I mean, as much as you don't want everything to be about just the college piece, right you don't also want to get in a situation where you go, oh, no. Why didn't Here anyone tell me? And why didn't right. somebody tell right. me? And you right. don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And yeah, your first time through with your first child, it's, it's all new. Yeah. OK, Jim. All right, to the uh, intervention slide. So actually, the one before the other one. There we are. Okay. So if I add those up, about 10% of our total student population. Yes. yes. Um, at, are, do you feel that at 10% is enough? Are we reaching all the kids that, that need to be reached, or do we need to reach more kids? Um, ba I mean, w based on our entrance criteria, yes. Um, I do. Um, Something that we saw prior to really having a systematic approach to intervention is that um, at one school, a student who was performing in the 65th to 70th percentile might have been placed in an intervention. That student has no business being in an intervention. <laughs> that, that's just not appropriate. Um, so there, it, really, it really varied across the building how kids, what kids were being supported. You need the right kids in there so that that, that targeted instruction is really the very most effective. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John. I, I'm going to come at this a little different, but you did, when you said sign language is... Uh, popular mm -hmm. and it's not considered a world language I understand we probably just got enough resources to do French and Spanish but are there then uh, places for students to follow up then at York in sign language I know some of our other high schools are teaching sign language as, as a, a world, world language, language. Mm -hmm. and the debate they're having because of their popularity is whether actually to offer two years and four years which is completely beyond but do we offer sign language at York we and do not what currently it offer like? it it's been something I, we've done a little bit of digging into finding someone who's certified to teach that is a mm -hmm. tremendous challenge um, uh, somebody who's a high school certified teacher with that sort of experience there is no endorsement in sign language to the best of my knowledge it would just be somebody who's certified in world language and then has that sign language experience mm -hmm. so that can be it can be difficult um, it's something that we've talked about a little bit but not something we've actively explored in terms of adding as an elective at this point in time but that was something we saw last year starting out with acceleration that it was very it was a very high 
uh, high interest level for our kids and now we're seeing that that's continued. It wasn't really just a fad. It continues to be something that is of high interest to our kids. So. Um, I, I just say that because I've heard it, and it is popular at some of the other high schools. And you know, if that's something that we can uh, provide at York, I think it would be good. So, as okay. I said, off topic. Oh, no, no not off topic. Yeah. Okay. Do you? Oh, can I? Okay. Okay. So, uh, looking at the other side of acceleration, so you've got ten percent, or how, what your percentage is that are in for intervention. Then the other 80 some percent, 85, 90 percent that are not. Are you finding that the acceleration times are really, um, what's the word? Like the kids are finding them really valuable? I mean, there's a lot of value when you think about it, uh, you look at it big picture because you can mix, this is me looking at it from a parent, you know, but. Kids who maybe aren't always, you know, once you start choosing things like an orchestra or a band or a language, your schedule starts to get pretty, you know, you start honing in with the yeah. same group of kids yeah. based on those preferences as you move through middle school and high school. So to me, it's an opportunity to mix kids in a different way. Um, there's so social, emotional pieces and so on and levels. But are you really seeing that the courses are truly adding value to their learning? Like for that, you know, is it sparking learning? Is it really exploring a wide variety of um, opportunities so that, you know, they can look back? Like, because now you're getting into where you have kids that will have done this for sixth, uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. By eighth grade, are they going, you know, I don't want to do this or, I guess, how do you maintain interest as you move through this and it goes on longer? And also, how do you keep the value of that? You know, it's 30 minutes, which in theory doesn't necessarily sound, you know, but it's like 30 minutes can be really valuable yes. and could change kids. Like, and especially at middle school, you want them to be engaged and try new things. So I guess just where do you see keeping the value in that time for the other 80 to 90 percent that right. aren't an intervention. So um, some of it continue will continue to be um, our teachers uh, coming up with new ideas as, as teachers become more and more comfortable with it settling into. Um, for some of our teachers they've developed enrichment units based on their personal passions. Um, that, and, and if you think back to your own experience as a student, when you have a teacher providing instruction about something they are incredibly passionate about, that really has that opportunity to trigger something. Um, I'll give you a really good example of a way that uh, Bryan Middle School really maintained their student interest in eighth grade. Last year, the, or, yeah, last year, the last cycle of enrichment units, the entire eighth grade worked on their eighth grade service project to the school. So they were redesigning an outdoor space to leave behind as their legacy at Bryan. And, and so kids had the ability to select categories of the work uh, based on their own personal interest. Um, and, and it was a really excellent way to wrap up their experience as a Bryan Middle School student by leaving that behind, but also being able to weave in their interest. So that's just one example. Um, certainly the opportunity is there to continue to grow that um, and improve upon that. Something that the teachers do um, is usually sort of save some units for certain grades so that um, students have, haven't exhausted all of those efforts by the time they're an eighth grader. Thanks. You're welcome. Jim. On that same topic, um, you said that uh, course suggestions were slowing down or new course flow was slowing down. Is that something you'd consider opening up to high school teachers to support, to submit classes? We certainly we could. We certainly could. We certainly could. Mm -hmm. You know, it, um, I think some of it was just some encouragement, like we're still here. And I, now that once they had enough units to start running at the first time, they got, com your teachers became very comfortable. Sure. I like teaching this unit, but then this unit may get a little stale to them and maybe maybe the students' interest starts to wane a little bit. And so now we're starting to see the units starting to, f to pick up again because now they're looking to do something a little bit different. Um, and most of the units are, are in things that either accentuate the core curriculum or go beyond it. 
Um, for example, one of the ones I looked at that she's still writing it, we, we give some feedback on it, was on matters and et manners and etiquette, which on the surface seems pretty, no, that'd pretty be simple. That'd awesome. <laughs> but, right, we talk about the soft skills and the six C's, but then also, okay, if you're going to a job interview, what are the compo what, how should you behave in a job interview? If you're being introduced to a large group or you're introducing someone to a large group, what are the manners there? You know, what are being polite at dinner? And what does that look like if you are in the United States, if you are in different European cultures, if you're in Asia? How do those things look different? And that was a teacher's idea that she's been running with, and she, she started that's, working on that, you know, over winter break. That, that's awesome. There are so many college kids that just don't know what fork to use. Well, right? well but, <laughs> but, I, but I would say even beyond that, when I, when I commented to Chris as, as our students who were recognized tonight, every student made eye contact. Every student said something, and, and that's a soft skill that our, all of our students need. Yeah. Um, and so for students who just haven't developed that skill yet, that's a great opportunity for them. We've talked about a couple things in regard to this idea of developing the units. Maybe a D205 university strand, something where teachers can see what's going on at the other schools, um, or just you know to get creative about, about how we continue to generate some ideas, uh, perhaps uh, build it into the institute day where we have teacher uh, presentations to their peers and and we but but we have we we have I, I guess the answer is we you know we continue to examine what we're doing and and we are looking for for new ways to promote um, uh, the development of these units and in response to feedback too we've also on the forum this dr. Henderson started this last year the forum does say you know how is this uh, course going to be rigorous how is it going to be relevant and how does it support students to develop in the six C's so we've tried to take those district learning and teaching priorities and put those at the front of the acceleration course development. Okay. Yeah, and, and going back to the, open it up to, I mean, if it's slowing down, I mean, especially for, I bet you there's a lot of teachers at the high school level can th that can think of a lot of things that would help eighth graders to know coming into high school. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, something we talked about the last time we talked about this topic, uh, where, what's our current stance on um, giving some kids some flexibility during this period to let them make up tests or kids that have a heavy extracurricular load to let them uh, use some of these as a study period? We, uh, as, a, as a general practice, students don't use this time as um, a study hall. Now, if we have a student who is coming off a hospitalization or some special circumstance, our guidance counselors work with that on an individual basis. Um, in terms of making up tests, we haven't heard as much discussion about that. Um, one of our schools last year did not have any issues with that. And so we would have those teachers as we would meet on our um, committees that involve representation from all three schools. They would constantly share the different practices they use um, because they had never utilized a study hall format. And so there's been some of that across school sharing to, to hopefully find some practices that will support our students, um, but maybe think a little bit more creatively. So as we talk about um, mm. making sure that students are engaged in those acceleration programs and making sure that they're on target, um, what do we have in place to make sure that we're ahead of it versus behind it? We want to make sure that they're always Engage, engaging, so we don't want to hear students and parents say, why, this is a waste of time, or kind of, or, so, you know, what are we doing students to make sure Students give feedback at the end of each acceleration course. Right. Not, not oh. yeah, the Can you reach oh. your mic? Oh, I'm sorry, you're doing, yeah. So we're, we are gathering student feedback again. Um, going back to the original question about how do we sort of know over the longer term, whether or not students are finding the courses engaging and um, things that they are interested in possibly pursuing. So we will be collecting student survey feedback again like we did um, last year, just not as frequently. Um, I'll maybe phrase it a different way. So when we first uh, deployed it, it the, the offerings weren't as robust as. Yes. Yes. We thought they might be. 
and what are we doing to safeguard that we don't get to something like that is gotcha. what I'm trying. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So um, starting at the midway point, uh, w once that feedback really started um, uh, being heard and, and being expressed, we went away from individual buildings sort of saying to teachers, sounds like a good idea, go ahead and do it, to all teachers submitting um, um, a proposal. And the three eight, last year, the three APs and I met um, on a regular basis to go through each of those and together as a team of four we made that decision. This year Dr. Cohen is doing that. So the teacher does and, and as he said the form asks them to to demonstrate where where um, how that incorporates rigor and as well as how it ties in with the six C's. Um, and then they have that opportunity to, to review that as a as a team of four and that way um, there's less variability in the level of rigor across the buildings. Because we saw given, that last and year. And we've given more feedback along the way in the course development. So, for example, the etiquette course. She shot me an email. I say, I like this. This is where, These are some things I think could add a little bit of substance to the course. Then she submitted the one-page course overview, which I gave feedback on. And then now she's going to go ahead and construct that 15-day unit from that feedback. So, you know, I've given her kind of two different rounds of feedback on her idea where before I think there were there was a lot of development and they just kind of gave us the package and said here you go. Or sometimes it wasn't necessarily being approved as a district course and they were running in their buildings. Um, I still get together again once a month with the middle school APs to look at any new courses. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, annual audit review, Mr. Welton. Yes, tonight uh, we have the board's auditor um, to present the um, comprehensive annual financial report, Andy Mace. Uh, Andy Mace is here from uh, Klein Hall CPAs um, to present the audit. Good evening. Um, have your 119 page report I won't go through it all um, if you read no further than just the management's discussion and analysis you'll have an understanding of what happened financially within the district for the year but I know you're you receive good financial information throughout the year so there really are no surprises here but a couple of things I'd like to point out uh, the district does go to the extra effort of preparing what's called a comprehensive annual financial report what makes that different is that it has the uh, introductory section and the 10 years of historical uh, data tables in it. And then it is presented to the Association of School Business Officials Internationals program for the or Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. And it has been a, an award winner for 10 or 12 years now, and I anticipate it will continue to be. Only about 40 districts in Illinois go to the extra effort of doing that. Um, so that's uh, you know a commendable accomplishment that the district continues um, to do. So it represents the uh, uh, the best practice in uh, transparent financial reporting. So that's great. Now um, I don't want to go through a lot of this, but there's a couple of comments I wanted to make. Um, one thing new this year was there was a new accounting standard, Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 75 on other post-employment benefits that affected Illinois school districts this year. So what does that mean to you? Mostly it relates to the TRIP, or what we call the Teachers Health Insurance Security Fund. That's uh, gap insurance between when the TRS employees retire and, and go into Medicare. Um, the effect of that was to recognize the net OPEB, other post-employment benefit liability, in the district's financial statements for the first time. That's done at the entity-wide level, so it's not in your funds, but the impact of that was um, restating beginning, fund, beginning um, net assets by an amount of $77,515,000. Um, at year end, the total liability related to this THIS 
related to the district was close to $130 million. The district's portion of that was about 62, the state's the remainder, about $67 million. Um, so what does that mean? Are you gonna have to write a check for that? Uh, no. Um, statutorily, you're required to kick in, it was 0.88%, per, now I think it's 0.92, I'd expect that to continue to go up. Um, but the state is not funding it. They're treating this as a pay-as-you-go sort of plan. So as, as these claims come in, they're just paying them. But it worries me among my school district clients that if ever the state was looking for some things to push back to the, uh, to the local districts for them to pay for, this would be a prime candidate. Um, the numbers are that big. The numbers, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the district's portion of this number is eight times larger than the district's portion of the TRS liability. Um, the TRS liability for the district, complete state and district portion, is f 451 million just for District 205. The district's portion of that is about eight and a half million. Um, these are big numbers, and they, and they worry me. And it gets me thinking then about your fund balance. You know, there's several good reasons to maintain healthy fund balances. Yours are about 40%, your general fund is about 40% of one year's current operating expenditures. And I put that kind of in that Goldilocks range. It's above one third, it's a below, below 50%, so it's kind of right where you want to be. Um, but, you know, you need fund balance so that you can react to any curveballs the state's going to throw at you. This one's scaring me here. Um, you need it for cash flow purposes and you need it for, um, you know, if you have any significant capital needs that you don't want to go out and borrow for. And there's other good reasons for it as well, but um, I think you're, you're poised in that Goldilocks range. So that's, that's really about it. Um, otherwise, our audit you know, our audit goes really well here. Um, your business office is well staffed with excellent professionals and, and uh, we get in and out of there in good order. Um, you know, you're adequately staffed. You have a good organizational attitude related to in internal controls. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, I, th I think they do a great job. Um, so with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Jim? To make I sure, sure I understand what you just said, uh, and I think it's found on page 38, if, um, you know, if, if all of a sudden the state teacher's retirement system became like uh, police and fire, where every police and fire district <laughs> handle their own pension funds, uh, we would need in order to fulfill our, our obligation, about a half a billion dollars. That's, that's what the numbers say, yeah. Okay. Um, and then talk a little bit more about uh, fund balance, because right now our fund balance is, you know, above our policy, our minimum policy range. Um, should we be thinking about changing our policy and increasing what, a rational fund balance percentage should be. Yeah, let, let me go back to your first point a little bit first. Um, you, know, you mentioned the TRS liability of almost a half a billion dollars. The OPEB liability worries me more than the teacher's liability. Be what page is that? Yeah. Um, and, and seven. Compare and help, pages and 38, 38 and 47. Help us, help us with the acronyms here as well. All right. Way. So TRS, Teachers Retirement System, so that's the, the pension plan for the certified employees. OPEB is other post-employment benefits, so that's the gap insurance between when the certified people retire and when they reach Medicare. New this year is the recognition in the financial statements of this actuarially determined liability related to these 
post-employment benefits. All right, so why does that one worry me more than TRS, even though the TRS numbers are bigger, okay? Because for TRS, there's a provision in the Constitution that the state's gonna provide for it. Now, I'm not an attorney, but that tells me that at least the state's not gonna completely bail on it, maybe they'll work on something. But there's nothing for the post-employment benefits. There's no mention in there at all. So it seems to me that if they were going to push something back to the districts, this would be a likely candidate. Okay. Have you heard them talking about that yet? Have I? No. No, that's just my, that's my opinion. Appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, getting back to fund balance, you know, I use that term Goldilocks, uh, you know, not too low, not too high. Um, you know, 25 to 33 percent on the, on the low end. What's your policy? Okay. And then 50, once you get above 50 percent, um, you know, certainly that's a, typically enough for cash flow needs. You don't want to go too high because then you run the risk of um, um, dealing with tax protests and you know accumulated excess balances and and then there's more of a leg to stand on for the protests to be honored. Um, but I'm a firm believer of maintaining a good enough you know a good amount of fund balance in there because the sca the state scares me. You know uh, your categoricals continue to be delayed. Um, or and or reduced um, um, these sorts of things worry me the state of the state worries me all those things worry me and I think are good arguments to support a healthy fund balance I mean in, in that vein and, and I'm looking you know clearly looking for your opinion here you know one currently our policy says 26 or 27 percent um, and you know, one man's healthy balance sheet is another man's overtaxation, right? So I'm just wondering if we should get our policy in line with the with the risks. You know, being realistic with the risks that are out there, given the financial condition of the state of Illinois. I think that would be prudent. And and so your recommendation. If, if I asked you for, for a range, what, what would your recommendation be? Uh, 40 to 50 okay. percent. Okay. So you're at the low end of that now? Okay. Chris? Just for context, we spend about $110 million a year, and that, that one health liability alone is 130. So when you talk about percentage of fund balance and what they could do, a small shift of that to us, let alone the $450 million that the state is delinquent on. It, it, so yes, it sounds like a big number, but when I'm looking at it as percentage of revenue related to the liability that's sitting out there, it's, it, it's small. I mean, it's basically everything we spend in a year just for the health care or the OPEP portion. Yeah, the, Which is great. I mean, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, the numbers are, are mind-boggling. They're, they're so big. And that's just this district. Think of it statewide. So it is easy money for them to transition that. Like they've been talking about the pension. I'm surprised they're not talking about that. That's why I asked you. But to Chris, to your point, is, is um, the, I, I mean, that is the way to look at it. I mean, it does sound like a high uh, fund balance percentage, but in reality, that's how you calculate it, is based on how, what's your revenue and then, yeah, the percentage of what it would do to how to recover it. And it would take, it would take more than a year. Right. Margaret. Oh. I'm wondering, because you, you noted that 40 to 50 percent um, as a recommendation. I assume you have, you have other clients school clients and I'm wondering what the average fund balance is for other clients well 50 percent would is at the high end certainly you know if you look at the average let's see I was at a district last night well here let me give you some examples now I was at a district last night that defers its first installment of real estate taxes. So what that means is that your June tax collections, they don't bring into income 
currently, so it's not a component of fund balance, all right? It's not in there. So they say that's for next year. So their fund balance is about 12%, okay? But they've got the cash in the bank so that they know that they're good cash flow wise. Now, if times got worse, and I've seen this happen, where districts deferred that first installment, where they couldn't anymore, they were, going, they were reaching and they were spending more than they had, or not had, but spending more than they deferred, so they had to switch back and recognize that. So there's a couple of ways to look at that. Now I had another district, I had two meetings last night, um, so that was the first. The other one, um, it's another one of your LUTA districts, actually. Um, who, where were they? They were at about 35%. <laughs> and the superintendent there, I, or maybe it was the board president, somebody had mentioned that there, they did, just yesterday they heard some more talk out of Springfield that um, maybe they were going to try to push this. And they kind of had the same conversation. Maybe we should up our, our reserves a little bit here. So to answer your question, what's the average? The average is probably more like 20, 25. Um, I think it should be higher. That's my opinion. Because this, this stuff out there scares me. Chris? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm not, I, 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 there may be some, uh, not to opine as to whether there's reckless districts out there or not, but there's a lot more you need to know before you know what that average is, uh, depending on how close to the edge some of these folks run their balance sheet. Um, but you, you alluded to earlier, and we've had these conversations ongoing, is, is really the target isn't the June 30 number, it's the May 31st number for us. And, and how many districts, are there districts out there that set fund balance as a target based upon low point? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's certainly a strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you might look at your um, May 31st balances. Because yeah. that was one of the conversations we were having is should we target low point to make sure that there's enough cushion at low point? Which is kind of the first and foremost is don't run out of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then, then I think on top of that is, and again, when you're looking at these numbers, yes, uh, you know, yes, they're large and yes, the state you know, constitutionally on the 450 million, but when they get to be that big, small percentages are big numbers for us. Um, and, and I think when you look at low point, it also gives you a more accurate idea of how much cushion you really do have. And I think our sense and, and our strategy has been to build fund balance at the low point such that if they were to throw five million or six million dollars at us, um, which as you can see is a drop in the bucket on this thing, that you'd at least have enough time to have a conversation with the community about what that means um, before you'd have to fill that hole. Mm -hmm. um, because, I, I mean, we're not going to come up, 50, 50, you're not going to get $500 million. You're not going to one check. Uh, yeah. But yet at the same time, <laughs> you're not going to be, the liability that's out there is unfundable. Um, you know, it, if it's this bad for us at state level, it's, you know, multiple times of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're, what we're really looking for is not to total escrow, you know, the entire exposure. It's to give us runway to have a conversation with the community and how they want to deal with what the state's doing. Um, because unfortunately, the lawmakers in Springfield are going to make the local school boards the enemy or the uh, bad guy because they don't have the guts to tell the public what they did. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. The, uh, the low point in the year is certainly a, a good way to look at it. And, I, you know, although I'm worried about the state tossing this our way, I can't imagine it happening overnight. That would be catastrophic to so many school districts. Yeah. Jim. So, uh, first of all, I agree with that statement that since there are so many districts that are unprepared for that, the legislature couldn't impose it because school districts just couldn't pay. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to understand. I just I just want to make sure I understand the accounting of the story you told about these other districts. The district that defers that property tax payment meaning they put it in the bank, but they don't recognize it as revenue until the new fiscal year. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
So essentially their 12% fund balance was they had a 12% fund balance at their lowest cash point of the year, right? And uh, yeah, 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 sure. And, and if you just assume that roughly half of the property tax revenues come in uh, at the uh, at you know June first, and the other half come in September first. Really, what they're running is a sixty-two percent fund balance. Is, is that is my understanding of that accounting? Well, you, you know, they're probably eighty percent local, locally funded. So it, they're they're more in the forty to fifty percent range. When you when you do okay, that. all right, all right, yeah, if, yeah. If, all right, yeah, that that makes sense if you yeah. assume it's not a hundred percent right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then a question that I feel compelled to ask every year um, is, you know, our, our employees put about 10% of uh, their paycheck toward uh, TRS. Mm -hmm. um, what does the school district match that with? The school district then, the school this district? school district then also computes, c contributes to TRS. Well, it's the, it's the 9%, right? Help me out here, guys. It's the 9% and that's it. The school district isn't. Uh, there's a small piece in the state taxpayer. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The, so the well, state, there's the. The state taxpayer. I'm sorry. The, it's not yeah, the school the district. But the state taxpayer also yeah. contributes. These are funny numbers. Uh, is that why you asked? $28 million. Twenty-eight and a half million dollars, in theory, is what the state kicked in to TRS on behalf of District oh, Two Hundred Five of our employees. Okay, so twenty-eight yeah. and a half million. Okay. All right. Okay, but I'm not sure I really believe that. That's what they tell us. That, that's they what give us a percentage, right? Which is roughly for for this year, it was forty-four and a fraction percent of your TRS creditable earnings. That's okay. what they say they kicked in. Got it. Okay, or what they were supposed to have yeah. kicked in. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Uh, next is superintendent's communication master facilities plan update. So we have a core planning team. It's the same cast of characters that you're used to. The uh, ICI people, the white people, and um, some of our administrators. And we um, have um, included uh, or explained to you that, that at various different points in the project, there would be various different uh, things going on and various different levels of involvement at, at depending on what decisions were gonna be made at, at any given time. And so we met on Monday to um, get everybody on the same page. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to take a look at is to, to get more specific about exactly what's going to happen over these next couple of months so that we could uh, communicate that to, to everybody and um, uh, make sure that we, we had a solid plan of attack of what types of deadlines needed to be met uh, to get the work uh, off the ground. So I just wanted to review that with you so that you knew some of the important things that were coming up uh, over the next several weeks. Uh, the first would be the Finance Committee on January 10th. And what I think is kind of unique about that is that that'll be the first meeting that we have community reps uh, uh, present. And we have three, uh, Gordon Snyder, David Lau, and Rob Martinelli. And then the week of January, or oh, we're going to talk about, Elizabeth Hennessy is going to talk about the, the bonding strategy at that meeting. Um, and also we're gonna talk about the topic of a uh, uh, demographic study and where the board's at on that issue, as well as some other things that are just related to our annual operations. Then the week of the 14th, uh, White and Company will have architects uh, meet with the principal at Bryan and Edison. The week of um, January 21st, 
They will then um, extend that out to a, a core team at each school, kind of like we have the district level core team. They will have a core team at each school with administrators and teachers, uh, parent reps, PTA reps, et cetera. Uh, on January, and then we have some built-in meetings throughout the year where we're gonna do, when we talked about some of those district level committees that needed to think about uh, district level decisions that go into the planning process and needed to occur early on like what do we want classroom spaces to look like what do we want media centers to look like etc we have some of those meetings um, interspersed throughout the next couple weeks the technology committee is meeting on january 16th so the architects are going to visit that meeting and have some discussions with that group the safety committee meeting is on january 24th uh, the um, uh, student services group is going to meet on January 30th and the media specialists are going to meet on February 6th. Then the first uh, all-day kindergarten committee meeting is scheduled for January 25th. So we have two board members, we have district and building level administration, we have kindergarten teachers from the district, PTA reps, we have 13 community volunteers that have expressed interest in being on that committee. And there will be three subcommittees, uh, a tuition and early implementation and a curriculum committee. Oh, I'm sorry, 24th. Yes, I should keep my glasses on when I do this. And then the, um, there are several meetings that, that need to occur that are going to be scheduled. We had a furniture committee that was meeting and that group will reconvene. And then we also, uh, Bev is gonna work on, with her team about uh, developing a, a communication plan, uh, a dedicated website, um, and some other, other different types of things that, that we would build into regular ongoing communications. And then um, we need to have some type of a process to take a look at the boundaries. So we have to get that off the ground uh, so that we can have some intelligent conversations about when we want to establish a date for the home purchase provision that we had discussed. And so the, um, so there's a lot of stuff that's gonna kick in real quick. And um, I just wanted to make sure what, that, what, that people were aware of what some of those first steps were. And then uh, we will continue to keep you updated throughout the process and make sure that any questions or concerns you have about anything um, is addressed in a timely manner so that we're all communicating effectively with, with everybody who is um, interested to know what's going on because the first couple months during the planning stages when they don't see the activity and those types of things, we wanna make sure that people have accurate information about the project and aren't filling in gaps with inf misinformation and things like that. So that is that. John. Dave, do you think we could keep it as a regular point of your updates um, with the advantage of having video on demand for whenever people wanna go look for it? They, they'd know exactly where to go for it. If you can give a brief, just as you did now, I mean, it was pretty extensive because there's so much going on, but I'm wondering if you could add that to our meeting on a regular basis so that people know where to go. Yes, I actually figured that uh, we, we would have the finance committee reports at the board meeting. We might have some special reports from Todd because Todd will be meeting with the uh, architects and construction managers on a weekly basis and then our core team will meet on a monthly basis. So there will always be a lot of activity. So there may be some special reports from Todd and then I thought that I would just keep this as a standing agenda item under the superintendent's communication so there could always be some type of information flowing. Very much appreciate that. I think it's a good way of letting our community know what's going on. To add everything, and Bev's going to be busy as can be, but I think that'll that all supplement and augment what she's doing so thank you anybody else all right uh, then we move on to tweet of the week oh, one of the favorite parts of our meetings at, from the communications and PR standpoint is the ability to shine the light on what's going on in our district Earlier, we spoke of the quality of our teachers, so we are going to preempt a little bit on Tweet of the Week, or uh, shall I say, 
preview what will become a great tweet. We received some news over the holiday break that three of our teachers have earned their national board certification. And if you know anything about that particular process, it's not the easiest feat. It's a pretty time consuming one. And it can take anywhere from a year to five years to complete. And it doesn't come without cost at minimum. If you're doing everything correctly without any kind of retakes or uh, going again at the process, it'll be a $2,000 investment. So I would like to say congratulations to three individuals, Stephanie DiPaolo, Patricia Rao and Shelley Rizuski, they have all earned their national board certification. Congratulations to them. We look forward to honoring them a little bit further with those tweets, with social media, and placing their information uh, into local media and on the website. So congratulations to those fine individuals for a wonderful, wonderful accomplishment. Thank you. Any board communications? Don't look at All right, uh, with that then, we have three upcoming meetings. Thursday, January 10th, 2019, we have a finance committee meeting here in District 205 Center at 6.30. Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting here at District 205 Center at 7.30. And February, Tuesday, February 12th, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting here in District 205 Center at 7.30. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you.